Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. As we return to the words of the prophets today, let us humbly look to the Lord for his understanding, for his guidance, and for his mercy for the time in which we live. Help us now so that together we might come to an understanding and a knowledge of that which he would have us not only to understand, but for those things that we need to accept so that our lives may become more clearly in step with his so that our characters may become that which may fit us for the kingdom to come. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you today asking, Father, that you forgive us of our sins. Father, we are seeing the time in which we live is indeed serious. And that the work that is before us is indeed great. We need you. We need your guidance, your direction, we need your angels. We ask for your spirit. We know that your spirit cannot abide where there is even one sin in the heart. Cleanse us today, Father. Show us that that we need to do. that needs to be done in cooperation with you. Please forgive us of our sins. Help us to be united with one another. Direct us in that which you would have us to do. May your angels attend us. May our minds be open so that we may accept that which you are teaching us. Thank you, Father, for this Sabbath, for this rest. Guide us now, each one. We ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. As I was led to prepare for the next chapter that we're going to be looking at, there were a couple of documents that I had looked at that we're going to read that should set the stage and help us to understand that which God's scriptures through his prophets have been trying to tell us. This first paragraph is very blunt. It's very direct. Those who rejected and opposed the light of the first angel's message lost the light of the second and could not be benefited by the power and the glory which attended the message. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Jesus turned from them with a frown. They had slighted and rejected him. Those who received the message were wrapped in a cloud of glory. They waited and watched and prayed to know the will of God. They greatly feared to offend him. Now, Sister White is writing more for our time 
than the time in which this was written. We've accepted this. What was the light of the first angel's message in the Millerite time? Do we not remember our history? In the chat, it is said that the message of the first angel was for the second advent of Christ. Now, is this not a warning message? This first angel's message. Okay. So it's the second and the third. So what is the light of the first angel's message for our time? We place that in 9-11, right? We place it in 9-11. And um, the woes we learned about the woes we learned about the Muslims I mean at that point we started really studying on it at, at, after 9-11 and we came up with that we understood who the who the uh, The wind was, or the east, eastern pe east people were. Right. What else did we learn? I mean, we learned quite a bit, but um, that's about the biggest thing that I get out of it myself personally. Okay. Now, as as we're going to look at some of these documents today. We're going to be comparing different lines that Sister White has presented throughout her writings, but we're also going to be comparing different portions of scripture, all of which are, are doing the work that we need to see and accept within our lives. <clears throat> Where did Elder Jeff make application for this on the first angel's message? What what message was it that he was addressing as being the first angel's message to the church at large? Uh, is it not uh, 1989, but, uh, the fall of Soviet Union, the king of the north, the king of the south? It, it, it's a nice point, but I would, I would have to disagree with you at this point, respectfully. Well, I mean, Jeff was talking about the approaching Sunday law. Well. So, I mean... Uh, so in, in trying to understand the first thing, are you talking about it initially? No. Which point? Uh, the old pass. Was it go back to the old pass? Habakkuk's tables? Thank you. That's, uh, that's getting a lot closer. Within Habakkuk's tables, Elder Jeff, I believe this was about presentation 77. Strange number that, 77. Elder Jeff placed the first 
first angel's message to the church as being the understanding of the seven times or the 2520. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Now, as this portion of this paragraph states, those who rejected and opposed the light of the first angel's message lost the light of the second and could not be benefited by the power and the glory which attended the message, behold, the bridegroom cometh, which she's placing in the third position. So this regarding the mark of the beast, she is also stating as being, behold, the bridegroom cometh. But what was the, the light of the second angel's message, if Elder Jeff has placed the first angel's message as being that of the seven times? Uh, the second is it not to know the role Islam is playing, and uh, that's to do with 9-11. Uh, Respectfully, again, I must disagree. Elder Jeff had placed the light of the second as being the understanding of the daily. Why is the message of the daily important for us to understand today? It ties up, it connects us or connects um, Rome. Yes. Because Rome establishes the vision. Have we not addressed this before? Yes, we have. If we are not understanding the portion of the instruction given by God to Moses regarding the seven times, and if we are not understanding that Rome establishes the, the vision, how can we be benefited to understand what is soon to come? How can we give a message that Christ is soon to arrive? Because are we not to turn from those things that are not of the Bible? Are we not to turn from paganism and papalism? Absolutely. Do we wish to find that Christ has turned from us with a frown? Do we no. wish to slight and reject Christ? The promise that she gives in these sentences, those who received the message were wrapped in a cloud of glory. They waited and watched and prayed to know the will of God. They greatly feared to offend him. Brothers and sisters, this is being laid upon our hearts today. This is being laid upon all of our hearts today. I saw Satan and his angels seeking to shut this divine light from the people of God. But as long as the waiting ones cherished the light and kept their eyes raised from earth to Jesus, Satan could have no power to deprive them of this precious light. What kind of a promise is this for us today? Are we not promised the power to overcome? Yes, sir.
Is this the type of promise that we should be able to hold on to? Yes, with much weeping and tears, but can we depend upon a promise like this, that Satan can have no power to deprive them of this light as long as we are keeping our focus on Christ? I heard a question in there. What was it again? Is this not a great promise? Oh, exceedingly. The message given from heaven enraged Satan and his angels. Imagine that. That the message of the seven times of Leviticus 25 and 26 and the understanding of the daily enraged Satan and his angels. This is absolutely fearful when you start to understand who else has been enraged by this message, by these messages. The message given from heaven enraged Satan and his angels and those who profess to love Jesus but despised his coming, scorned and derided the faithful trusting ones. But an angel marked every insult, every slight, every abuse they received from their professed brethren. Very many raised their voices to cry, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, and left their brethren who did not love the appearing of Jesus. And who would not suffer them to dwell upon his second coming? I saw Jesus turn his face from those who rejected and despised his coming. And then he bade angels lead his people out from among the unclean, lest they should be defiled. This is in First Spiritual Gifts, page 152.2. And this is only the, a partial portion of that paragraph. This paragraph <laughs> contains more promises and more admonitions for us today than many pages of that which Sister White has written. We need to consider this carefully. Now, just as we were just examining that which has been presented as the first and second angel's message, I'm going to share with you something that was read for worship this last week. The great leading temptations wherewith man would be beset, Christ met and overcame in the wilderness. His coming off victor over appetite, presumption, and the world shows how we may overcome. Satan has overcome his millions in tempting the appetite and leading men to give up presu to presumptuous sins, one to another. There are many who profess to be followers of Christ, claiming by their faith to be enlisted in the warfare against all evil in their nature, yet who, with hardly a thought, plunge into scenes of temptations that would require a miracle to bring them forth unsullied. Meditation and prayer would have preserved them and led them to shun the dangerous positions in which they have placed themselves and which give Satan the advantage over them. I would submit to you for our consideration that appetite, presumption, and love of the world can also be drawn upon a line as being the equal of the first, second, and third angel's message. 
would you have a problem with this? Would you have a question about this? The promises of God are not for us to claim rashly, to protect us while we rush on recklessly into danger, violating the laws of nature or disregarding prudence and the judgment God has given us to use. This would not be genuine faith, but presumption. The thrones and kingdoms of the world and the glory of them were presented to Christ. Never will we have temptations as strong as those that assailed him. Here we have a promise. Christ has borne the burden for us and has been assailed with huge temptations that we will not have to see. And these temptations we would not need to bear, but in a like manner, we will see them. But Satan comes to us with worldly honor, wealth, and the pleasures of life. These temptations are varied to meet men of every rank and degree, tempting them away from God to serve themselves more than their creator. All these things will I give thee, Matthew 4, 9, said Satan to Christ. All these things will I give thee, says Satan to man. <clears throat> All this money, this land, all this power and honor and riches will I give thee. And man is charmed, deceived, and treacherously allured onto his ruin. If we give ourselves up to worldliness of heart and of life, Satan is satisfied. From what we read from First Spiritual Gifts, If we choose to set aside the understanding, the symbolic understanding of the seven times, or if we choose to set aside the understanding of the daily, which on which the pioneers were all united, we are satisfying Satan. Now, if we, look at, if we look at our line, yes, um, is there is there a parallel then with the seven times and the daily that are, in a sense, hidden to to this movement as far as what the temptation is? I would think so. So, what would they be? How would they? How would we parallel them? Well. When we look at our line right now, have we not had a, a parallel with appetite when we look at this with what went on with Parminder and Tess? And have we not had a, fair, a, a, a further parallel with the separation that's occurred with this movement? To that of the daily well the thing about the daily is it's the two desolating powers right correct so you have uh, pagan rome which is a literal counterfeit of the earthly sanctuary animal sacrifices right and then you have uh, the papacy which is a counterfeit of christianity right the christ's work in the heavenly sanctuary so it's it's a a spiritual counterfeit right and so part of when we when we bet, went and looked at the um millerite history when we were examining the foundation 
and and we had this impression that um you know one of the points was was france you know daniel 11 if we looked at how the pioneers understood daniel 11 I mean, they understood it as Uriah Smith understood it. So Uriah Smith wasn't presenting something new. He was presenting what the pioneers had understood. But what they had failed to, to recognize is that you couldn't apply the literal in the time of the spiritual. Right. And so I think we do have a parallel in how we understand our own minds per, uh, um how we, how we understand their fulfillment, how they're placed in, in our line. So when we're dealing with something like the Trump prediction, the pandemic, um, um, and even understanding Nashville and its relationship to July 18th, we made the same error that the Millerites made. And that's, right. and that's, and, and that's going to be, even though it's under the first angel's message, they make that error. We know also that they believe that the close of probation was going to happen when the Ottoman Empire fell, right? That it would be right shortly after that, that the seventh angel would begin to sound. And, and so they kept expecting this close of probation. They kept moving it over. Um, and, you know, they had it, you know, at, at uh, the Feast of Trumpets. So the first day of the seventh month, because they, they knew that probation needed to close prior to Christ returning. And so they were trying to take what they were understanding and, and fulfill it all literally. And even after 1844, you still have people who are who are trying to get, um, you know, the Day of Atonement connected with the cleansing of the earth by fire. Right. Even, even though they understand that Christ is in the heavenly sanctuary, they, they still are going to set time you know, seven years after 1844. And, and they're, and they're still going to misunderstand the chronology because they're, they're going to place it in November because they think that the, the Jews be, or the Karaites uh, begin the year one month later than the Jews. So, so there's a, a, a misunderstandings or lack of knowledge that occurred in that history. And, and in, in Adventist history, uh, you're going to see it, that is going to be manifest in the rejection of the correct view of the daily. It's just going to continue on. Uh, I don't know if I explained it well, but I hope people can kind of see the point. That we need to understand our lines in the context of the past. And if we don't understand the past correctly, we'll make the same errors. <laughs> How did Santayana say this? Those that refuse to learn the lessons of history are doomed to repeat it. If we do not learn the lessons of our spiritual past, are we not going to be repeating those lessons in our time? It's logical. This statement that if we give ourselves up to worldliness of heart and of life, Satan is satisfied, should be a trumpet call to all of us today within this movement. For do we wish to please our adversary, or are we looking to Christ, the author and finisher of our faith? The Savior overcame the wily foe, showing us how we may overcome. He has left us his example to repel Satan with scripture. He might have had recourse to his own divine power and used his own words, but his example would not then have been as useful to us. Christ used only scripture. How important that the word of God be thoroughly studied and followed. 
that in case of emergency, we may be thoroughly furnished unto all good works, 2 Timothy 3.17, and especially fortified to meet the wily foe. I was shown that had you regarded the light has given you through the testimonies of warning, you would not now need this testimony. You would have been advancing in the divine life, and now you would have had your abilities used, especially in the work of Christ, to the glory of God. But your mind is dwarfed in spiritual things. As you have concentrated your mind and soul upon worldly things, you have power in that direction. You are decidedly a worldly businessman. God designed that you should use your ability and influence in a higher calling, but Satan has had more control of your mind than the Lord. You idolize the world. Mammon is your God, and yet you are so dazed and blinded by the God of this world that you really suppose that gain is godliness. You have dwarfed the higher powers of your being to serve the world. You are a slave to mammon. Your family might now have been devoted to the service of God, but your example before them, they, have, they had no courage to urge their way and strive to enter in at the straight gate when you were continually encouraging their minds to love and serve worldly things. A responsibility that rests upon you, Brother Lay, that you do not realize in the great day of final accounts, unless you make a decided change in your life, many will change their charge their ruin upon you. The blood of their souls will be on your garments. You knew your master's will, but you did it not. You have quieted your conscience in regard to your true condition until the voice of God is but faintly and seldom heard by you. Your family are taught that work, work should be the great aim and ambition of their lives. They are too thoroughly weary to have strength left in reserve to devote to the service of God. They have had sometimes realized their condition and made efforts to change their course, but you have piled so much worldly care and constant labor upon them that they have been overwhelmed and they sink into discouragement. You have allowed yourself to be a slave of the world. You have also arranged matters so that of necessity your family have been slaves to the world. The young ruler asked Christ what a good thing, what good thing he should do, that he might inherit the kingdom of Christ. Jesus answered, keep the commandments. He returned the answer. All these have I kept from my youth up. What lack I yet? Matthew 19, 17, and 20. Jesus then points to the defects in his Christian character. He had not kept the commandments of God. He did not love his neighbor as himself, which, if not removed, would debar him from heaven. Go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me verse 21 jesus would have him understand that he required nothing of him but that he had himself experienced and all he asked of him was to follow his christ's own example he left glory and honor and riches to come to a world of sin to save lost man. He became poor, that man through his poverty might be made rich. Jesus then gave the sure promise, thou shalt have treasure in heaven. How did the young man receive the words of Christ? Was he rejoiced that he could in any way secure the heavenly treasure? He was very sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Riches to him were honor and power. 
the largeness of his treasure made its disposal seem like an impossibility. This is the danger of earthly treasures. The more men gain, <clears throat> the harder it is to break in upon the hoarded treasure. To diminish the principle would be like parting with life. Rather than do this, the young man turned from the immortal heavenly treasure. He decided to keep his earthly treasures that he had gained and that he loved rather than to diminish them for Christ's sake and have the immortal heavenly treasure. His heart was set upon his earthly treasure and he sacrificed the heavenly for the earthly. Oh, what a miserable change. Yet many who profess to keep all the commandments are doing this. You are doing this, dear brother. Be not offended because I tell you the truth. God loves you. How poorly have you returned this love? <clears throat> I was pointed back and saw how earnestly the truth had struggled for the supremacy in your heart. I also saw how earnestly Satan had sought to deceive and mislead you and place the world before you in its most attractive light to enchain your senses and benumb your sensibilities to God's claims. Satan has succeeded in a great degree. Now you will have to make a most earnest, persevering effort to dislodge the enemy and assert your liberty, for he has made you his slave through the love of this world. Your love of the world has become a ruling passion, increasing with exercise until it is brought in subjection to its control your powers of mind and body. Your example to others has been bad. The grace of God ruling in your heart and bringing your mind and thoughts into subjection to Jesus Christ would make you a powerful man on the side of Christ and the truth. Selfish interest has been first with you. By your profession, you say to the world, my citizenship is above. <clears throat> While your works say decidedly you are a dweller upon the earth. May this not be said of us. Yet, so many things that I have read here, I've had to apply in my own life. How are we to stand before Christ? How are we to stand before his throne, before the mercy seat? Are our garments to have any spot and wrinkle on them? No. Are we to have any love of this world? That would be another no. Every day we are presented with what it takes to develop the perfect Christian character. And it is only by faith in Christ that we may become righteous. Because there is nothing in and of ourselves that we can do that will make this occur, except that we agree to let go of that, of this world, so that our lives, our hearts, may be filled with his spirit and prepared to give his message. As a snare shall the day of God come upon all of those who dwell upon the face of the whole earth. Now, what did she just say here? The day of God come upon all those who dwell upon the face of the whole earth. Does she say that this snare, this day of God, is only going to come upon some? 
No, she said all. All. Your faith will be, will only be a hindrance to souls. If you have not corresponding works, I know thy works, says the true witness. Revelation 3.15. God is sifting his people, sifting their purposes, sifting their motives. Many will be sifted till nothing remains, no wheat, no value in them. Christ is committed unto us talents of means and of influence, and he bids us occupy till he comes. This includes everyone who has reasoning powers, who claims to be his servant. All are required to improve according to their capabilities, whatever they may be. After a long time, the master cometh and reckoneth with his servants, and all are called to the strictest account. What use have they made of their master's trust? The first servant shows that he has gained 10 pounds. The second has gained five pounds. The Lord commends them saying, well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been a faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Matthew 25, 23. Every man received his own reward according to his own labor. Each received in exact proportion to the zeal, the fidelity, and the success that he had in trading with the talents. We've had much that we need to understand regarding the first the second and the third angel's message. We have much we need to observe regarding appetite, presumption, and love of the world. We have seen that the appetite that has been expressed, that we are to reject the understanding of the charts that we are to reject the understanding of the seven times is greatly accepted within many of the churches today. And we see that there are yet few that understand the warning of the daily and of the transgression which shall maketh desolate. Is not the understanding of the daily an understanding of a civil power? And is not this paganism? Is not the other side the transgression which makes desolate an understanding of a religious power? And is this not indeed papalism, where we must rely upon others, upon fallible man, to tell us what the scripture reads? How may we show <clears throat> that we are approved unto God? What are we to do? What admonition did Paul give to Timothy in this regard? He told him to stir up his gifts and to be faithful to the end. <clears throat> Did he not say directly to study, to show thyself approved unto God? Yes. What are we doing when we are applying 
chronology and history with the lessons that we are learning from the Bible. Are we not studying in the same manner that the spiritual pioneers of this faith had once studied? Yes. Can we do any less? Are we not to follow in their footsteps? Are we not to place our feet upon the old paths? Yes. <clears throat> now, it is not our desire to reject Christ. It is not our desire to follow after man. Yet we find multiple times within scripture that there were warnings, that there were guidance given <clears throat> that were not accepted. Today is a trumpet call. Why were, why were the trumpets given? Why were the trumpets used? To show warning and also judgment which is coming. Okay. <clears throat> to give a warning. Because an adversary is coming. That war is coming. It was also used to bring people to an assembly. How can we be assembled if we are not agreed? How can we battle? How can we be prepared for war if we are not in step with one another? Hosea chapter 6. It is given to the Jews have to be taught how to uh, perform war at one point. Of course. Uh, and that was early on, if I'm not mistaken, after uh, uh, coming out of the wilderness. Then they have to be shown how to, how to battle. I mean, were they were they prepared as an army when they came out of Egypt? I don't see that. Yet, what was the promise of God? Well, that they would go into a land and possess it. By faith, Caleb and Joshua spied out the land. By faith, they understood that they were well able to possess this land if they walked by faith in their deliverer. Were they concerned with the manner in which God's promises were interpreted. In other words, did they rely upon methods of biblical interpretation to understand that they needed to have faith in God? Did they have others beside Moses that stood as an intercessor for them between God and them? Who is our intercessor today? Christ. So it is Christ alone that is our high priest. 
that is standing before the mercy seat on our behalf. Can we not have faith in Christ, in our elder brother, to do that which is necessary on our behalf? Hosea chapter 6, <clears throat> we have an exhortation to repentance. We have a complaint against Israel and Judah for persisting still in their wickedness. We are called by the trumpet today to repent. We, are, we have a complaint against us within this movement for persisting in wickedness because we are not united with our brethren. Judah and Israel are yet separated. Sister White writes in manuscript 163 of 1897 in paragraph 24. Read chapters 4 and 6 of the prophet Hosea. Those who trample upon God's law make human laws, which they will force the people to accept. Men will devise and counsel and plan what they will do. The whole world keeps Sunday, they say, and why should not this people who are so few in number, do according to the laws of the land. Because they are blinded by error, because they take their words from the lips of the priests and the human lawmakers, they suppose that it does not matter if they do not keep the law of God instituted in Eden, when the foundations of the earth were laid, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. God's memorial was then given to man that he might honor the name of the living God who made the world in six days and sanctified and blessed the day of his rest. Now, did not the Savior say that the, the sum of the law is for us to love God supremely and love man? Is that not what we are to do? It's love God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Yes. And then uh, love your brother as you would yourself. There you go. At this point, we have all seen the developments where many would have us to believe that God makes mistakes. Does God make mistakes? That is entirely impossible. Yet, Mankind, in man's wisdom, <clears throat> believes that God has made a mistake. That's presumption. Yes. And when we are accepting of presumption, when we hold on to presumption, is it not because we have chosen in our appetite to have rejected that which God would have us understand spiritually? And where does this lead us? Off the path. Right. Where does the path lead us? Christ and his kingdom. 
does it not lead us to follow Christ as he has left the holy place and begun to minister in the most holy? Yes. So here again, appetite, presumption, love of the world. Can we now see that this can also apply to the courtyard, to the holy place, and to the most holy place? Uh, yes. What happens to those that have remained in the holy place? Satan stepped in front of them, and now they and they didn't notice. When Christ <clears throat> stepped into the most holy place, what was he doing? What has he been doing in the most holy place? Of judging the dead. And as soon as he is finished with the judgment of the dead, which I would believe was finished by 9-11. What is he then to do? The living. Judge the living at that point. So, in the judgment of the living, is he not then taking the sins of the living And addressing that those that are still following him are worthy to have their sins blotted out of his book of life. We must consider this as we study. Are we worthy? <clears throat> that these sins would be eradicated. <clears throat> Hosea 6, 1. Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn and he will heal us. He hath smitten and he will bind us up. I have not in this message any comfort to give to Satan. The arrows of the Almighty must wound you so sorely that you will feel that you need a physician. I have torn, saith God, and I will heal. I have smitten you, and I will bind you up. When you come, meek and lowly, then Jesus will pardon your transgressions. I charge you not to leave this house till the power of the enemy is broken. We then knelt in prayer. My soul was drown, drawn out in agony for Daniel Boudreaux. He prayed for himself rather faintly. <clears throat> I prayed again and again with strong cries and tears for God to cast out the devil. Brother A.C. and Marion, his wife, prayed with great brokenness of spirit. A terrible struggle was going on with Daniel. He did not fully surrender, but his face looked as though soul and body were rent asunder. He made concessions, but had not yet yielded. I would say that Brother Boudreau was in a fearful place. Are we not called to yield all that we are, all of our sins, all of what we think we have accomplished? Are we not called to yield this to Christ, to let him do his work and let the spirit do its work within us? Brothers and sisters, there is none above us 
save Christ. We are all sinners. We all fall short of the glory of God. This is not an easy message to give. As I've said many times before, I point no fingers. Because the moment that I do, I have three other fingers pointing right back at me. When it is said that all have sinned, I must count myself in that number at all times. After two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. What does this say to us today? Is there something symbolic that we can take from this? Three-step testing process. Yes, a three-step testing process would be very correct. Have we not seen since July 18th of 2020, taking us into 2022, that we are being revived in the messages and the studies that we are being shown that God is yet in control and that there are many points from the lessons that have been given within scripture that we had yet to uncover. Are we not to be prepared to live directly in the sight of Christ and in the sight of his father? How can we do this if we don't understand that which is presented before us? Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning. And he shall come unto us as the rain and the latter and former rain unto the earth. Is this not showing to us that when we come to understand more clearly the warnings of scripture, applying ourselves to understand the chronology and the prophecies that we shall know if we're following on to know the Lord and that he will give us this, this rain, that he will come to us as this message. And I saw that if God had changed the Sabbath from the seventh to the first day, he would have changed the writing of the Sabbath commandment written on the tables of stone, which are now in the ark in the most holy place of the temple in heaven. <clears throat> Revelation 11, verse 19. And it would read thus, the first day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. But I saw that it read the same as when written on the tables of stone by the finger of God and delivered to Moses in Sinai. In, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Exodus 20.10. Does God change? Negative. Are we not told specifically, I am the Lord, I change not? True statement. 
I saw that the Holy Sabbath is and will be the separating wall between the true Israel of God and unbelievers, and that the Sabbath is a great question to unite the hearts of God's dear waiting saints. Is she speaking here about the Sabbath of the seventh day alone? Was not the seventh year, the Sabbath of the land, also to be a Sabbath for man? Yes. So if we are ignoring one, the seven times of Leviticus 26, are we also not ignoring the seventh day Sabbath? I would think so. So if we are putting aside the understanding of Leviticus 25 and 26, because it just doesn't fit, because the other churches don't agree with it, because our method of interpreting scripture doesn't agree with it, are we not as men setting ourselves above God? Presumption again, yeah. Yes, it's through presumption. And if one believed and kept the Sabbath and received the blessing attending it, and then gave it up and broke the holy commandment, they would shut the gates of the holy city against themselves as sure as there was a God that rules in heaven above. I saw that God had children who do not see and keep the Sabbath. They had not rejected the light on it. And at the commencement of the time of trouble, they were filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth, Hosea 6, 2 and 3, and proclaimed the Sabbath more fully. This enraged the church and nominal Adventists, who is being enraged? The nominal the ch church and the ch it. Yes. The church and those that in name alone are looking for the advent of Christ. As they could not refute the Sabbath truth. And at this time, God's chosen all saw clearly that we had the truth. And they came out and endured the persecution with us. And I saw that the sword, famine, pestilence, and great confusion in the land. Here, she gives reference to Ezekiel 7, 10 to 19, and 2 Esdras 15, 5 to 27. The wicked thought that we had brought the judgments down on them. They rose up and took counsel to rid the earth of us, thinking that then the evil would be stayed. Second Esdras 16, 68 to 74. Here again, word to the little flock. Page 18, paragraph 4. Are we not the little flock today? That would be us, yes. So is this word today, is this instruction today directed for us? Well, the prophets wrote more for us in our time than for their own. What do you see here, brothers and sisters? We have an admonition. If we are willing to accept the Sabbath, all of 
the Sabbath. All that had been given as Sabbath to mankind and to the land. Then are we not to understand how to keep the Sabbath in spirit and in truth? The gospel was first preached in Eden, Genesis 3, 15. Satan cannot touch the head. Praise God for that wonderful work of God in the salvation of man. There is victory for man. The devil will use your mind if you give it to him. When Christ came into our world to break every yoke, he did not rank among the highest or the richest. He was from Nazareth. He worked as in the carpenter's trade. He honored labor. Does he not know all about his subjects? Well, yeah. Christ, our priest, worked as one of us. Christ, our king, lived as one of us. He was a carpenter. Christ, he worked our, with wood. Yes. Which we're social, we're kind of a symbol of, man is kind of a symbol of wood. Exactly. In so many ways, we are very much like the wood. So I was thinking about the ark. Yes. And, and how it was built. Yes. And so um, the ark is made of a cage of wood, which are sticks, basically. Okay. So uh, one of the things that I know about carpenters is they like to join things together. Okay. You know, with little sticks. Right. And the, the occasion, if that's, if that's truly after I've gotten through the Hebrew and everything, um, the case, you know, it's, it's those are little sticks of wood. And then those little sticks of wood representing man in a sense. And then that outer covering being gold. Um, that's, that's Christ, that's Christ's character. Because we're supposed to be that art. We're supposed to be that thing that has that Ten Commandments inside of us. Uh, with the knowledge of the blood of error. Those things. And the law that's, that was on the side of the art. Because uh, we're, we're as temple, right? Isn't that what we're supposed to be? As temple? Amen. Uh, it was just an interesting concept as I was going over it the other evening after one of our meetings. Amen. In a recent morning worship, the premise that was presented was that <clears throat> we are to be as Paul saw it, excuse me, as Peter saw it, living stones. Where is it that God is going to choose to dwell. In the earth made new, is he going to is he going to dwell in the heavens? Uh, no, he's going to dwell with us. Here, yes. I think. The way I have it understood. Those that are faithful. will dwell, will have God dwelling within them. For is our hearts not to be prepared for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit now? Yes. How are our hearts prepared for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? <laughs> well, they're tenderized first. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they're so stony, you know. Um, and right. they have the, 
it has to be hard. You know, uh, Christ has to enter into it. And has to, uh, write that law on our heart. So it can become fleshy. Are we not to release every sin? We cannot hold on to a single sin before the spirit can have indwelling with us? Yes. There was a certain man that pleased God. A messenger was sent to him, an angel from heaven. Here we are told to see Acts 10, 5 and 6. Acts 10. And now sent men to Joppa and called for one Simon, whose surname is Peter. He lodgeth with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea side. He shall tell thee, what thou oughtst to do. And when the angel which spoke unto Cornelius was departed, he called two of his household servants and a devout soldier of them that waited on him continually. Is it possible that God knows just where we live? Cornelius offered prayer with all of his offerings. Cornelius did not fully <clears throat> understand the work of Christ. A clearer light was to be given to him, brought by the human agent. The divine agency cooperates with the human agency. We may ignore it. We may reach the world standard. If we do, we miss the mark. God can give light. You accept one ray of light, and it prepares the way for another ray of light coming forth as the morning. It is though gleamings are coming. Just follow on to know the Lord, whose coming forth is as the morning. It will shine brighter till it shines as the sun at noonday. Since 2005, since the time that Dwayne Dewey called Elder Jeff, and recommended articles regarding the seven times of Leviticus 25 and 26. Has not great light been showing? How yes, many, yes. And how many have chosen since then to accept that light? How many yet have chosen to reject it? Are we not told that we are to gather up all rays of light? Well, yeah. What happens if we reject the light? Well, the light goes out, then we don't accept the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Do we not fall off the path if we choose to reject the light? Well, yes, yeah, we talking about the midnight cry being behind us. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Rejection of the light causes the light to go out. And then we stumble and fall off the path. To the question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? We answer, serve God with all the powers of your mind. Jesus Christ paid the price for the redemption of man, paid the price for the sins of the whole world. Why do we not come? Here the reference is given to John 3.16. God's love for man led him to save man from perdition, to establish his feet on the rock of ages. Christ made the infinite sacrifice that we might have the life that measures with the life of God, an eternity of glory and bliss. The Holy Spirit impresses the divine truth on every humble, teachable soul 
and commends the truth to our conscience and judgment. Thus also it is impossible for us to be kept in uncertainty and questioning doubt as to whether we are indeed the children of God. It is your privilege to have a deep and living experience in the Christian life. If you will only follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning. From the light which the Lord has given me, that which has seemed to you the most trying experience has been for your best good. You and every soul should study more earnestly to have a living connection with the great source of light and never be inclined to yield to temptation, to venture to choose an uncertain path which leads to darkness and to unbelief and binds you up in bundles with the unbelieving. We must individually choose whom we will serve. So our salvation is found in the corporate church alone, right? No. What was the last statement that I just read? We must choose individually whom we will serve. We must individually choose whom we will serve. So our salvation is based upon our family and our family connections, right? No. So our salvation is based upon the pastor that tells us what to believe. My children die for a lack of knowledge. Amen. Just like Israel of old, we must individually choose whom we will serve. <clears throat> Did Caleb and Joshua choose to serve according to the will of the multitude? No. Did Elijah choose to serve according to the teachings of the priests of Baal and the priests of the grove? Another no. So we must individually choose whom we will serve. In Earth's history, never has a group, never has a church been given greater light than the church today. Never in Earth's history has a church rejected greater light than the church today. It is up to us to gather up all of the light that is being given along our paths. We are to learn even if it taxes our minds. We are to learn even if this causes us to question the things that we have learned in the past. For is there anything in the Bible that is not useful? Oh, not the smallest tittle or the least dot. So everything is there. Everything is good for our instruction, for our admonition, <clears throat> to help to mold our characters to become that like that of Christ. Yeah, but it's a cooperative. Agreed. You know, it's it's a cooperative. You know, you have to be cooperating, or it's not going to happen. It's 
not going to be, it's not magic. We want to cultivate every faculty and every power to know God in Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. We want a personal knowledge of him. We may think we understand something about the truth and the Bible, but the revelation of truth is much beyond anything that our finite vision can comprehend. Christ leads us. When we are caught up to meet him, and enter through the pearly gates into the city of God. He leads us by the living waters. And all the time he is educating and talking with us about the things that he would have opened to our understanding upon the earth if we could have borne it. Prophecy, chronology, history, and scripture combined is what we can bear today can we choose to set aside any portion of this without falling into darkness uh, no. but we I mean, do yes. not yeah. I mean, yes <laughs> i'm sorry we we can't we can't afford to set to set any of this aside. That's what the no is for. Okay. But we do not walk fast enough. We take too many back steps. We do not advance heavenward. Therefore, the light that would have come in glorious rays could not come to us because we were not prepared for it. We take a step back into the world to the gratifications of earth, and then we take a step toward heaven. And then we take a step back, and then we take a step toward heaven. Does that sound like progress to you in any manner? Sounds like you end up in the same spot. Exactly. If you follow on to know the Lord, you shall know that his goings forth are prepared as the morning. You know the morning light first breaks upon us in a very dim light and then increases. And it increases in brightness until the king of the day marches in the heavens in all his glory, in all its beauty. Ye shall know his goings forth are prepared as the morning. Hosea 6.3. Now, if God's glory were to shine first upon us as he wants to let it shine, we could not endure it. Daniel could not endure it. He prayed to the Lord and the Lord answered his prayer. The angel opened before him the great events of the future and the history, which is of so much value to us. Daniel and the Revelation are as one book. We need to accept it as such. Satan means to take up the minds of every one of us that we shall not be acquainted with what is coming on the earth, that we shall not know that the day of God's great preparation is upon us. Here Daniel prayed to God, and one of the heavenly angels was sent to him. Who was sent to, to Daniel? It's not just one of the heavenly angels. Who was it, according to Daniel 9? Was this not Gabriel? Yeah, yeah. Who did Gabriel replace? Lucifer. He replaced Lucifer. Lucifer, the son of the morning, the light bringer. So if Gabriel replaced Lucifer, was he and is he not covering cherub above the very throne of God, above the mercy seat? Yeah, that would, that's where, yeah. Yeah. So is he not intimately acquainted 
with the mercy of God? Oh, oh well, yeah, for sure. <laughs> He's sitting on the mercy seat for crying out loud. <laughs> okay. Here Daniel prayed to God, and one of the heavenly angels was sent to him. As soon as he caught the sight of the glory, he fell helpless to the earth, and the angel touched him to give him strength. Well, there he was. He could just look again at the glory, and there was no more strength in him. Again, the angel touched him that he might hear the words, and yet he could not behold that glory which was presented to him until he came as a man. Brothers and sisters, consider this. July 18th, 2020, the movement was touched. We have been shown the glory of God. We have been shown the mercy of God. Is this movement yet to be touched again? We need to consider these things. We need to place this on a line for our understanding of the time in which we live. There is much more to the warning that we find in Hosea 6, but our time is now coming to a close. Do you yet have questions, comments, or thoughts for what uh, questions? Just, are yeah. you doing the? Are you um, attaching these files to any of the Zoom stuff? I will you know. see to it that they are sent out so that they can be downloaded by all. Thank you. Okay. Any other question today? Any other thought? Shall we then close in prayer? Gracious Father, we thank you that in your infinite wisdom, Jesus is now before the mercy seat to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to cleanse the sanctuary that is made without hands from all unrighteousness. Please direct us today. Please guide us. Show us that that you would have us to do. Help us to come into a clear understanding of what it truly means to enter into the Sabbath in spirit and in truth. May your will be done. Be with us now in all things. Direct us according to your great wisdom. Help us now as we separate. Direct us where you would have us to be. For this we thank you, and this we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen.